Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it great to have our brother Bill Mayer on the piano this morning for our <laughs> prelude? How we need you, Lord, and we welcome you in his name, and we gather to give him praise because of his faithfulness, because of his goodness, because of all he's done for us over the last 40 years. Happy anniversary, City Center, and welcome this morning. It's going to look a little bit different as we celebrate our anniversary today, but our hearts are no less open and no less enthusiastic as we give the Lord praise and we gather together. So we're gathering in this physical room at 1075 Eglinton. We're gathering on the live stream over the internet, and we're gathering on Zoom. You can see your church family this morning. We wanted to represent our community as diverse as it is and as spread out as it is, so we've brought them in on Zoom today, and many are joining in that format. If you're on Zoom this morning, I'm talking to you here, don't do anything you don't want us to see, because we can see you and you can see us, and we're just looking forward to something special as we as we gather as the church. We are the church this morning, celebrating God's faithfulness. So if you're visiting with us, if it's your first time here, we'd love to get to know you better. Click on the connect button that's on your screen or visit our website and click uh, contact us, connect with us. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your prayer requests and uh, tell us about yourself and how we can journey together with you. Our children's ministries are happening both in the building. If you brought kids with you, you picked up uh, some activities that are centered around today's service from Miss Heidi, and if you're online, you can click on the Just for Kids button, and it takes you to the kids' study and worship for this morning. Those buttons on your screen also take you to our Give page for your regular tithes and offerings. If you're a visitor, please don't feel obliged to participate in that. That's part of our worship, and it also takes you to our Connect button. Uh, we have so many things happening uh, around City Center, both in the building as much as we can and as safely as we can and in remote fashion via zoom and via meetings and small groups happening all over the city our website what's happening page tells you more about that and how to get connected and how to sign up you can get all the latest there if you're on site this morning we just ask you to follow the instructions of our volunteers who are all over the building we'll tell you um, exactly where to go and guide you after the service stay in your seat and I'll give you instructions for leaving but as we are here together whether we're in the service whether we're on the live stream or on the zoom we want your time this morning to be centered on the Lord we want to hear from him and speak to him words of praise so as we do that let's affirm our community of the church by standing together and why don't we greet one another greet your friends on the camera greet your friends on the live stream and prepare your heart to worship him this morning Hope you're ready to clap your hands and raise a hallelujah to him. Raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a
We are here, Lord. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. Oh, we are here for you. We are here for you. Open your heart to him. Center Baptist Church for this 40th anniversary. We look back with much praise to the Lord for the six years we labored in planting this church. They were glorious years as we trusted God in faith to see the land, uh, the Lord uh, miraculously procure land for us and provide sufficient funds to meet our needs. It has been a personal delight to see what God has done at City Center since the foundation that we had the privilege to lay. It has been great to see continued growth through the years. 
But things have been much different this year with COVID-19. Yet the Lord is in charge, and we pray that you will grow in spiritual awareness and love for the Word of God, even during the, these difficulties that we face. A verse that has been precious to me this year is 2 Corinthians 4.16. So, we do not lose heart, though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. I hope you are using this time to grow in the Lord and be renewed inwardly. I'm not sure if I'll be around to celebrate this anniversary next year. I happen to be 90 years of age now, but thankful to the Lord for still good health. Yet this body is only a tent, and when this tent is destroyed, we have a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is our genuine hope. We trust you all know the Lord as your personal Savior, and we know that if you do know him, we will see you someday in glory. So in the meantime, may the Lord bless every one of you as this anniversary is celebrated virtually. Thank you, Max, for getting in touch with me, and Derek, may the Lord enrich the congregation through your ministry. Goodbye. We will remember, we will remember, we will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise, for great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand together.
seated. Good morning, City Center, and happy anniversary. Uh, 48 years, wow, I can't believe it. It's a, that's a significant milestone uh, in the life of your church. Uh, in fact, when Max was in touch with me, I thought, mm, you made a mistake. It can't be 40 years. It's not 40 years, but it is. So Pastor Derek and the City Center Church family, I want you to know this morning, I pray for you and I thank God for the blessing that you continue to be to me and to our family. A uh, simple message to you today, I want you to stay strong in your faith. So that requires some effort on your part. We usually don't drift into faithful growth. It's often faithlessness that overtakes us. Stay strong in the Lord and stand upon his promises in the challenging days of this pandemic. Remember God said to Joshua, only be strong and courageous. Well, then you be strong and courageous as you live for him. And we can stand on these promises. He will provide peace for our anxious hearts, hope when life seems hopeless, and strength when we're weary of living through COVID-19. It was the Apostle Paul who explained the means by which we can stand on these promises. In Ephesians 5, he exhorts us, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He not only promises <coughs> uh, these promises for us that are sure and certain, he provides the armor to protect us as we journey toward our final destination. Stay strong, City Center. Stay strong. Don't ever waver in these days. And make the years to come the greatest in the life of your church. Karen and I love you and wish you well on this the occasion of your 40th anniversary. Celebrate well. <laughs> This is not the 40th anniversary celebration we expected or planned. We had a big do already, and God has taken us in a different direction. So let me add my voice to one of four. You have four pastors in the 40 years. Jim Rendell is the founding pastor. Steve Bell will speak to us in a moment. And uh, uh, Dan Schur, of course, and then uh, I've been here now with you for 14 years. That's a long time to be with a church. I wanted to just show you our founding document. I won't read it all to you, but I want you to know some significant facts. So the document in front of you says, whereas City Center Baptist Church, Mississauga, was born on August 19, 1980. How many years ago was that? 40 years ago. With eight, only eight, we now average about 1,000 on a Sunday morning, only eight founding members meeting at the home of Andy and Nita Vamis. They deserve our appreciation, don't they? They're a very special part of our church to this day. And whereas regular worship began on October 12, 1980, meaning at Fairview Public School, 3590 Joan Drive. Does anybody know where that school is? Yeah, it's not far away. Now let me read you the names of those who constituted, uh, legally constituted the church a little bit later on. Within a year, the church was a fully constituted church. Uh, the Baptist Church, Bruce and Marta Allen, Lambert and Marie Baptist, John Baptist, how cool is that? <laughs> we had John Baptist here, <laughs> Allen Laurie Estabrooks, I know John by the way, I think he's in heaven now, Allen Laurie Estabrooks, Beth Ferris, Don and Brenda Grady, founding members, Neil LaFleur, Les and Nancy Lindquist, also founding members. Stephen Long, Doreen Rains, Jim and Anna Rendell, founding members. Hugh Rendell, 
Cheryl Rendell, George and Fran Seymour, Murray and Blanche Taylor, Andy and Nita Vamis, founding members, Derek Vamis, Doug and Sharon Watson, Alf and Elizabeth Welsh, and Lorne and Vivian White. How cool is that? We have a record that we were founded 40 years ago, and it's my privilege to be able to pray with you on this 40th anniversary. But before I do, I want to remind you, it hardly seems possible, and it feels very fitting that on our 40th anniversary, we are bringing our third and final family to their one-year mark. So the Hacopians and the Luckmans are reaching their first year in a couple of weeks. So thank you, City Center, for relocating these three families. And our missionary of the week are Steve and Marilyn Jones at Fellowship, the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Church headquarters. And I wanted to mention our missionary family because... They have been a key to our journey. We have been a missions-minded, missions-supporting, and missions-loving church for the 40 years that we've existed. And by the grace of God, we're going to keep on these sacred partnerships. So glory to God, church family. Would you let me lead us in prayer? Will you pray? Uh, let me pray with you and for you. So we very carefully come to this moment in the full realization that all the glory belongs to you. And we give you thanks for what you have done in these amazing 40 years. As one of our present members said to me the other day, 2020 adds up to 40. <laughs> we thank you, Lord, that despite the hardship of this year, we get to celebrate that you are building your church, that you have touched this body, and that you have used this church for the honor of your name and for the fame of your gospel. We say thank you for every blessing, and they are beyond number. And we praise you for the many hardships that have shaped the lives of the members of this church into the people of faith that they are. How do we ever thank you, Lord, for every life that has passed through the doors of this local church? Because they number in the thousands. We thank you that we've had the privilege to speak to, partner with, grow with, and love every life that has come to us. We've won with many and we've lost with some, but you are Lord of all, and we commit the lives of all of the people of this church through its 40 years to you, Lord. It's such a joy to see faces on the, uh, on the Zoom screen this morning of people that no longer attend here, but who, are, who have been a significant part of our journey as a church. Bless their lives. I give you thanks for every elder, pastor, deacon, staff member, and the great host of volunteers that have made this church function for the glory of your name. And so now, Lord, we ask, may your hand be upon us, as Pastor Dan said, to keep us faithful. And we pray that we will be fruitful in the kingdom of God, the winning of the lost, and the building up of your church. I pray, oh God, as we're living in difficult days, when the mood of our world is changing quickly to be anti-Christ, I pray, O oh God, that we will stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, that we will not compromise truth and the right way according to your word. So I plead you, with you, Lord, to protect this church. As Jesus taught us to pray, I ask, deliver us from the evil one and set a head of protection around this church. May we move forward in faith, for we're excited, Lord Jesus. If you do not return soon, we are excited about our future. We believe that you will lead us in the upward way, and we will go with you by faith. Now bless your people as we continue to celebrate and look to you as the one who has blessed our lives, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
It's hard to believe that so many years have gone by since we left City Center. Thank you so much for an opportunity to be in touch again. As I thought of what to say, more memories have come flooding back, some hilarious, some sad, some poignant, and some profound. I am reminded especially of God's working in individual lives, the struggles, and then the victories. There are those who came to Christ and those who were baptized sharing testimonies that blessed us all. I think, too, of the memories of church life. We began in a high school, and some of those early services were so simple by comparison to today's standards, but it's humbling to think how God used them. I am amazed how he allowed us to grow in so many ways. Worship grew, and God gave us a great pool of talent to draw from. Staff grew, attendance grew, sometimes faster than we were ready for. But some of it was exciting, exhilarating. Friendships grew. There were people whom we suffered with as they faced deep pain. And pain has its own way of forging, forging wonderful relationships. 
You gave my children a great church home to grow up in, and Blanche and I are so grateful. You provided us with an extended family that enfolded our, our family, and I cannot thank you enough. There were so many lessons learned as we were forced back into the Word again and again for wisdom that we didn't have on our own. I think of Sunday school classes, small groups, and even some committee meetings where we learned things together that we could have never learned on our own. With all the growth, facing a building program became inevitable. It took longer than we expected to get the shovel into the ground. There were days, delays in trying to decide what to build, delays in getting approvals. If we could go back, there are definitely things that we would have done differently. I'd like to think we would have had more faith and risked more. The God we serve is so great, and he wants us to know the bounty of his free grace and to know the joy of being challenged by an expensive Christianity. I remember from time to time having lunch in the cafeteria on the top floor of City Hall. I'd look out the windows at the panorama of the city and pray that God would meet the vast need of a young, dynamic, growing city. I still see Mississauga in the same way. And I pray that God would bless you beyond all you ask or even dream of as you seek to impact the city for his kingdom's sake. You have been blessed to know 40 years of God's goodness, and may you know much more of it in the days to come. God bless you all. I'm convinced that the best way to celebrate 40 years and give God the glory that he deserves is what we do every Sunday morning and read the Bible. And my text this morning is Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Many of you probably don't even have to turn there. But while you are, let me read the word of God for you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill, or dare I read this, a city church? Set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all that are in the house in the same way. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You don't have to work very hard at this text to find a simple outline. Number one, we are the salt of the earth. Uh, the Greek rendering of this text says, Jesus pointing to the disciples says, you, you only. It's written in the emphatic. He's saying, you, my disciples, you, my people, you, my church, you are the salt of the earth. City center. You are the salt of Mississauga. You are the salt of Ontario. You are the salt of Canada. You are the salt of the earth. So says Jesus about his church. The conventional wisdom, of course, in coming to this text is that we all know that salt preserves. Salt flavors. Salt cleanses. It's aseptic. It halts infection. Some of you may remember trying to bob in the Dead Sea and the salt content is so high that if you have a slight scrape on your skin, it burns like nobody's business because salt is an aseptic. It halts infection. It also creates thirst. So salt is good. You are the salt of the earth. But as I examine this text, 
seems to me that it's highly possible that Jesus used salt as a reminder to the disciples of the covenant that God made with Israel. You see, salt is a literary symbol in the Hebrew scriptures where it was used for the binding of the covenants to suggest their permanence, and it was a symbol of the covenant itself. So no doubt Jesus used salt in the conventional, proverbial way. It preserves, it flavors, it, it cleanses, and, and so on. But this was a Jewish context. He's talking to his Jewish disciples. And they would have made the connection immediately of the prominence of salt in the offering of the sacrifices in the Old Testament. As early as Exodus chapter 30, Moses was told to make a frankincense that would be offered to God, and part of the recipe was salt. You shall beat some of it very small and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I shall meet you. It shall be most holy for you. So salt was used in the tabernacle. It was actually sprinkled in front of the Ark of the Covenant as a sign of the permanent promise that God was making to the earth. You move on to the book of Leviticus, and we're told that the Israelites were instructed, don't ever offer a grain offering to God without sprinkling salt on the offering, because it is the salt of the covenant, as it's later called. In Numbers chapter 18, Aaron and his sons were told that the people would bring holy contributions to the Lord, and he and his sons would share in a part of those contributions. And then the Lord said to Aaron, it is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord for you and your family with you. And then finally, in 2 Chronicles chapter 13, we're told that the God of Israel gave the kingship over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt. Are you tracking with me, church family? I'm sure I've lost some of you. Salt is understood in its conventional way or in a metaphoric way, but it probably had a much deeper meaning to the ears of the disciples. And what they heard Jesus saying was, God will not be without a covenant witness in the world. And the church perpetuates the covenant calling to Israel. So when Jesus says to the disciples, you are emphatic, you and you only, you alone, are the continuation of the covenant that I made with Israel long ago. The church shares in the sacred promise that God gave to the earth that he would make a way for us to be reconciled to him. And that our sins would be atoned by the blood and we could be forgiven the covenant is God's promise to the world that he would make a way not to destroy us, but to save us. Do you remember Genesis chapter 9, the reference to the rainbow? The rainbow is God's promise to the world that he will never destroy the earth again by a flood, but he will make a way for us to be saved, to escape the coming flood of his wrath that will fall upon the earth. So when Jesus said to the disciples, you are the salt of the earth, you know what he's saying to them? You are my witnesses in the world of the continuing covenant I made to mankind in ancient times that I will make a way for you so that you can have eternal life, so that you can be reconciled to God. City Center Baptist Church, we are the salt of the earth. We exist to signal to the world that God has made a covenant with man. And it's a covenant of his salvation. Do you remember how Paul took this idea of the covenant when he took a cup? And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The church and only the church is the custodian of the new covenant until Jesus comes. Israel was given a covenant We've been given, let me back up. Israel was given a covenant until Jesus came the first time. 
The church has received the covenant sealed in his blood until Jesus returns in his glorious second appearing. So City Center, we are in Mississauga to resist the decay that is taking place all around us and to perpetuate the sacred covenant. Your life is a reminder that God made a promise that he will make a way for you As we live and exist as a church, we're announcing to the world that God is the saving God, promise-making God of the universe, city center. It's a simple outline. We are the salt of the earth. I hope and pray that the privilege and honor of that great call upon your life is dawning upon you today. You are the salt of the earth. Now, let me just remind you, I think it does refer to our character and It does refer to our behavior for sure, but there are greater implications. And I can tell you with joy that I've met some people in this church, many people in this church in the last 14 years of whom I would say, oh my goodness, they are the salt of the earth. You need to resist the decay that is taking place all around us. Speak up against the evil. Exert the conscience of a Christian in the darkness of the world and don't be afraid to say, this is wrong. This is wrong. Salt preserves, purifies. But salt is a covenant of God's promise. Number two, simple outline, church family. We are the light of the world. So Jesus said, again, it's written in the emphatic in the Greek, you, my followers, and none other are the light of the world. The Jews, of course, saw themselves as the light of the world, according to Paul in Romans chapter 2. But we know that the true light is the suffering Savior that was predicted in Isaiah chapter 42, where the Lord says to the nation of Israel about the coming Messiah of Israel, I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nations. A light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out of the prison those, uh, excuse me, out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. So the promise was that the Messiah would be the light of the world, the light of the nations. And of course, you remember just a few weeks ago, we studied that event in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, where Jesus came back to Capernaum. He taught in the synagogue, and what did he read? This very promise. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And Jesus announced, today this word is fulfilled in your hearing. Because he's the one at the festival of lights, by the way, the sacred feast of Sukkot in the nation of Israel on the the, the, day, the last day of the festival of lights, do you remember, as the lamps were still burning in the temple, Jesus stood up and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And he repeated it two more times in John's gospel. So how is it then that Jesus said to his followers, you are the light of the world? If he is the light of the world, it's quite simple. We derive and reflect his light as the moon reflects the light of the sun. I'm thankful for the sun and its brilliant warmth and light. But I particularly like sitting out under a moonlit night. Because I'm always reminded the moon has no light in itself. It only reflects what is given to us. We can only reflect, derive and reflect the light that we have in the world from the light of the world. That's Christ. And we too are, as he says, you and you only are the light of the world. I can barely get beyond that without feeling the need to drop my head in worship of Jesus, the light of the world, to realize that I get to share in his light. It's exactly what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5. You are 
to walk and live as children of the light. You're no longer in the darkness. You remember how he put it over in Philippians chapter 2? This is the most irritating verse in the Bible for me. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. It's the most irritating verse in the Bible for me. Stop your whining. Stop complaining. Because he says, you are shining as lights in a dark world. Moaning and griping and complaining in the life of the Christian is dulling the light that we derive and reflect from Jesus. We are present in Mississauga to remove and expose the darkness because we are not only the salt resisting decay, we are the light removing the darkness. Now, just a quick sidebar, city center. It's really popular on social media right now for Christians to be making absolute fools of themselves. Shut off your social media account, quit arguing with people, stop griping, complaining, and getting sucked in to the world's fight. It is not your fight. I see so many Christians that are doing nothing more than cursing the darkness. So I was told as a young Christian, you can curse the darkness or light a light, light a candle. Stop cursing the darkness. City center, shine the light of Christ for another 40 years. Incidentally, the illustration of salt and light have one thing in common. They exert their influence silently. For the children who came to the service this morning, Miss Heidi has one of these glow sticks for you. You're supposed to break it, and it's supposed to shine. Is it shining? I thought that was very effective for the children that will be in the service because it's a reminder that we are the light of the world. You still track it with me, church family? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Thirdly and lastly, we are a city set on a hill. So I was in our prayer gathering recently, and a wonderful sister who's been struggling with cancer prayed for our church. You know what she prayed? Matthew 5, 13 to 16. And when she prayed those words, God bless city, I thought of the promise of Jesus that you are a city, church, set on a hill. City on a hill is obvious, isn't it? If you go to Israel today, you'll see that many of the buildings are still built out of the white limestone. And the white limestone would gleam in the sun, and the lights at night would illuminate the way to the city. So it's obvious. Don't hide your witness. Don't be ashamed. Are you ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of his witnesses? Or are you a city set on a hill, shining your light, speaking the truth, living as the salt of the earth? That's an obvious application, isn't it? City on a hill also refers to the Old Testament prophecies about the time when Jerusalem or Zion would be lifted up before the world and the nations of the earth would stream into it, celebrating God's salvation. So a city set on a hill is the divine community of redeemed people from the whole earth, from all over the planet. Watch carefully in the text. The metaphor of the light is positioned next to the metaphor of the city, and the city is inhabited by individual homes. So where does the light of a local church come from? From the home of the individuals of that church, from your home. If the truth of the gospel preached from this pulpit is not practiced in your home, then our light is greatly dimmed. If the doctrine we instruct from the word of God and in our small groups is not being practiced in our home as though we have the right to choose what God says is the thing to do, the light is dim. We are a city set on a hill. The light illuminates the darkness, but the light will only be as strong as the homes. Men don't take a candle in a home and cover it up. Everybody in the home would stumble in the darkness and smash their face on the floor. 
So he says, you are the city set on a hill. You are the light of the world, and your homes need to be places. Notice, this is the first time in Matthew's gospel that he uses the word father. It's one of his favorite words. He'll use it 44 times. Jesus used the word father 16 times alone in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. What is he saying? He's saying that core to our identity is our presence and participation in the life of the divine community of the church. The city set on hill on the hill is the community that gathers as God's family. <laughs> You're my brothers and sisters. We are, we are a family of God. With God as our father, Christ as our elder brother, and the spirit as our shepherd and comforter and guide. So key to the church doing well is the spiritual health of each home. City center, we exist in Mississauga to resist the decay, the moral, ethical, and spiritual decay all around us. We exist in Mississauga to shine the light of God's grace and love and his son to a dark culture. And we exist to welcome all men to come and receive Christ and be part of his glorious church, his wonderful family. When people come to City Center, they ought to hear. If they don't hear it, they should feel it. Welcome home. Welcome home. Next to my family and my home, this is my favorite place to be. There's no one on earth I'd rather be than with you as God's people, worshiping the one who has redeemed us by his grace. We are salt, light, and community. We're a city to which the world is looking for the light of our God. So the question then becomes in the five minutes I have left, how are we salt, light, and community? How do we fulfill the commandment and the calling of Jesus upon us that we are the salt, we are the light, and we are the city on a hill? It's answered in the text just before the passage I read to you. It is through the developing, carefully developing the character of Christ, the character of the Christian. Augustine called the first 12 verses of Matthew 12 a perfect standard of the Christian life. So you see, character is fluid and can change by the grace of God. If you are stuck in a bad habit and you're honest about your own heart, you know there are places that need to be changed. But there is no formula that man can give you that will change them. But there is a formula. You take the mirror of God's word. You read what it says. And as you're reading, it exposes your heart before God. And you say, I see the parts of me that need to be changed. And you take the old lump of clay to God and say, reshape it, Lord. Remake it, Lord. Create it into your image. Are you given to lying to make yourself look better? Take it to God and say, you have to help me deal with my deep insecurities. Are you prone to stealing? Are you prone to lusting? Are you prone to anger? Are you prone to fear? Then open your Bible and see what it says. Let it expose the error of your way. Go to God and say, I want you to remake me, remold me, reshape me. I want to be like you, Lord. Those are the 12 Beatitudes. Blessed are the bankrupt, the poor in spirit, who know they have nothing to bring to earn God's favor. Blessed are the broken, those who mourn, have godly grief that leads to repentance. Blessed are the humble, an awful lot of pride around, isn't there? An awful lot of pride. Pride will make you do some really stupid things. Pride is the cardinal sin that keeps you stuck in the air of your way. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the hungry. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the forgiving, the merciful. Blessed are the forgiven, the pure in heart. A pure heart is one that has been forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Christ. Blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed are the persecuted. So how are we salt, light, and community? 
by allowing the character of Christ to be transmitted to us, transforming us into his image. The second thing he says is by your conduct in verse number 16. You know, I love about reading this passage. (laughs) First, there's an inward focus of the condition of your heart before God. And then he says, now having taken care of your spiritual life, look to the needs of others. Get off your duff and serve the world. (laughs) Help somebody else. God has helped you. You help somebody else. God is building you. You build somebody else. What did Jesus say? In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see, see your good works. Hold on. Didn't Jesus say just a couple of chapters later, when you're giving to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He sure did. So this isn't a conflict, is it? This is Jesus saying, just don't be braggadocious about your good works, but be full of good works. Don't put them on the evening news. For everybody to congratulate you. You notice that people are doing that these days? How about you do your good works quietly without need of anybody noticing and praying and hoping and waiting till God in heaven gets the glory for what you've done. You can test your good work whether it will bring glory to God or not by how much you need others to see it. See, the church needs to be filled with preaching, teaching, and spiritual growth. But if it is not filled with good works, it is not the church Jesus designed it to be. We need to teach and train people to serve him. Tell them what the Bible says and then show them how to do it. (laughs) We're not supposed to just educate. We're supposed to activate fellow members to go into all the world with every good work that you can. What are good works? I say it's any act that blesses, encourages, and helps another human being in their need. How easy is that? Any act that blesses, encourages, and helps another human being when they are in need. Sounds very much like our core values. We need to know who we are in our spiritual identity. We need to allow him to shape our character to be like that of Christ. We need to build strong relationships in the community of the church, and we need to go on mission together. We need to make a difference in our city. A food drive is impressive, and it's great, but it isn't enough. Our good works need to be engaged every day, all the time, to whoever is in need. Fill your life with good works. Spend your days in the mornings talking to God and fueling your heart, and then go and shine the light of good works for the glory of our Father who is in heaven. Let me just conclude by reminding you that none of these characteristics are possible or attainable apart from a deepening and growing and sweeter relationship with the living God through his son, Jesus Christ. And the further you go in relationship with him, the brighter your light will shine, the savory your salt will be, the more savory your salt will be, and the more beautiful will be the friendships that you have built in the church. Father, thank you for a church that is salt, light, and community. And we testify that this is your doing and we give you glory for your church and its place in this dark world that we live in. Thank you, O God, that you have not left yourself without a covenant witness in the church and your people represent you as the light of the world. And now I pray that we will be filled with the good works that bring you glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're the God of this city, you're the King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are. Let's stand and worship Him. You're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are.
church family. Amen. So this past week I had the joy of connecting with our dear friend Edwin Jacobs over in Chennai, India. And at the end of the conversation, as we shared various things that are going on in India and Canada, I said, Edwin, would you just do me a favor, please look squarely at the screen because I want to pronounce the benediction on you. And so I want to give you the same benediction. It's become one of my favorite. You already know what it is. I'm asking you, though, this morning, feel the blessing of Almighty God through these words. Receive the blessing of Almighty God. Don't just feel it, but say, I'm taking it, Lord, into my own heart. And then rejoice in it. If you're comfortable to raise your hands, I'm going to give you the blessing from Numbers chapter 6. And I'm saying this from my heart for each one of you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Now hold your hands up. Listen to this. Numbers chapter 6 says, when you pronounce that blessing, you have set my name upon my people. His name is upon you today. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Please be seated just for a moment. 